various other committees for professional societies. Right now, I've been working with Acumen on macro implementation, and I've served in a bunch of other things. Um, some of which will basically come out the role with this talk. So, medical practice, dealing with economics and politics. Most of us physicians have felt it's never been logical. You know, and I've been always struck that doing what is economically smart has never really been true of academic medical centers or community hospitals. My friends in private practices have not had that luxury. They've got to be, you know, worry about the economics. But medical centers live in this complex political environment with matrix reporting relationships to many governmental bodies as well as local and regional populations. And they are really trying to please all these gods. You know, Aristotle taught us that politics is the allocation of values by society. Paul Sandelman, <coughs> most of you are my age, read his old economics textbook um, in our basic econ courses. He said that economics is the allocation of resources by society. In medical practice in this country, the weakness tension between, as society tries to work out the economics and politics for individual population health, our political system wants to avoid using the word rational. It's too politically charged. And yet the consequences of everything we do is often um, results in rationing. Okay. Now I gotta figure out. So my agenda this morning, I will mostly spend the time on uh, macro, a little bit on some of this stuff, um, and then a small bit on the uh, care management e and reform, because I was a uh, main party to all of that. So macro, everything in Washington has its um, initials or acronyms. And so Medicare is the Medicare and Children's Insurance Reauthorization Act. Back up until 2015, we had something called the sustainable growth rate, which affected Medicare reimbursement for all physicians every year. We had to get a fix from Congress every year to deal um, to keep 30% pay cuts for Medicare beneficiaries from coming into effect. Um, and so all of our policy folks in Washington wanted to get this repealed, and they saw an opportunity in 2015. I personally think they made a mistake because having a must-pass piece of legislation every year with Congress for which we could attach a bunch of other writers to fix defects in the health care payment system was a good thing. We no longer have that, that as a possibility. The other thing um, was, if you all remember, in 2014, <coughs> CMS just said it was going to phase out the surgical globals and have my surgical colleagues document and bill e &M services with the same things I do as a cognitive care provider with e &M. Um, My beloved surgical colleagues went ballistic over that. Um, and then there was all this issue about CMS lack statutory authority to pay us doing uh, chronic care management for any chronic care services, because they were all non-face-to-face. And the original Medicare statute in 65 specified everything had to be face-to-face -face time in front of a patient. Um, so MACRA delineates a couple of new payment methodologies and physicians have to participate in. The main one that they are trying to make onerous is um, the Medicare incentive payment system or quality payment program, whichever thing you want to call it, at MIPS or QPP. Um, it was replacing the old value-based modifiers, the meaningful use stuff we have with EHR. Um, but in physicians, how they report will either receive a bonus or penalty, and the penalties fund the bonuses. Um, it had, again, meaningful use of electronic records, clinical practice improvement activities, but two new things, and these are the important, these are the things I've been working on. It will have resource consumption and outcomes per measured episode of care per physician. It will also publish resource consumption per patient per physician and by specialty. So the alternative to the mix is basically moving into a plan that takes our ego at risk for patient care. You become functioning an insurance company. 
and this is not just about Medicare, but it, it hits all, by 2023, 75% of your entire practice has to be at risk and not be for service. Um, and, but you will also still be subject to the reporting out the cost per beneficiary in comparison with your specialty, as well as those episode of care. So you're not fully away from all the mix. Um, so the, the macro assumptions is that they're going to use all these episodes of care with the alphabet soup we all know so well for physician payment. DRGs, APCs, the ambulatory um, payment system for hospitals, CPT, ICD-10, and the acuity coding with MCC <coughs> and HCC, as well as uh, HCPEX level 2. All these tools were developed for different purposes, and we're now using them for a new purpose for which they were never designed. Um, now, Medicare also has this great assumption, so does our commercial um, policy, our insurance industry, that the claims data is accurate and that the services and claims are appropriately linked to diagnosis. Uh, just um, how many are all you physicians out there? So, how many of you think your claims diagnosis is 100% accurate? <laughs> I don't see any hands coming up, and I would agree. The other big assumption is that diagnostic groupers like DRGs <coughs> represents a homogeneous patient population, and that any variation in cost and resources is due to our behavior as physicians rather than to patient necessity. Um, it also makes a big assumption that the outcomes, uh, or the outcomes for measure of one disease are not at all impacted for the therapy for other. When I was in some of the planning meetings for the implementation of this, I, I as a cancer um, physician and hematologist, I use a lot of steroids. I cause diabetes. My patients who are diabetic, I make their diabetes impossible to treat because the need for steroids to treat their cancer or use as anti-emetics. Um, Medicare was just stunned when I mentioned this to them because they had not in any of their thought processes uh, considered the fact that trying to do good for one disease made another disease have a bad outcome. The other thing they really didn't think about was new therapies. And in my field, I've had to deal with, and I'll briefly talk about later, the chimeric antigen receptor T cells, these new CAR T cells that are half a million a pop with a million and a half hospitalizations surrounding them. Um, and our beloved private payers make all the same assumptions for very selfish reasons as CMS does. So as you move forward in the macro era, unless some of us can do something about it, um, granular coding is going to be vital. Um, I've had a lot of time over my career for various <coughs> administrative roles in addition to my academic roles to review cost and claims data. And medical hospitalizations are, have much more heterogeneity of cost and resource consumption than any surgical procedure. Um, and for medicine doc, it's basically the resource utilization is driven by the disease, the disease stage, and our interaction with comorbidity. And often less by, obviously, any procedures being done. The, um, for the MIPS thing, I was in charge of the pulmonary episodes of care. And we chose um, the, a simple pneumonia as our episode of care when required in, an inpatient hospitalization. In that, we saw the standard deviation of resource utilization or hospital charges and claims to be two to five fold greater than the mean or median, no matter how long or short I made the episode of care for measure. Um, but even when I've had to be part of the cancer group where we looked at simple or partial mastectomy, there's a lot of heterogeneity of charges. But nothing, but there it probably is more 50% of the mean, not two to five times the mean. Um, now, the, everybody says, well, this is to encourage you to go into APMs, but APMs require you to take financial risk. Well, to do this, you need, a, you need data on all the clinical drivers of costs. Um, 
Some of the cancer proposals have excluded outpatient chemotherapy, but not excluded chemotherapy given as inpatients. And that's going to make inpatient diseases like the one I've treated, acute leukemia, a very undesirable patient. Um, so when you document for something like COPD, if they have hypercapnia, you've got to put that um, as part of your claims data, do make that sort of acuity adjustment for the patients who do the worst and cost the most. You're going to have to document mental health issues that are compromising care delivery, and, and you have to document why somebody has poor compliance. Um, and um, already in my uh, Medicare administrative contractor has said for every diagnosis and claims, you need to have a line item in the E&M note about them or the surgical procedure note. Um, the other issue is for me, as a cancer leukemia provider, you know, every visit I have in the outpatient setting, I've got 20 to 30 labs. Well, they now want individual diagnoses after those labs. So if I have a diabetic, I need to, instead of listing everything as AML, I've got to put diabetes next to the glucose. If uh, they're hypertensive and I have them on um, antihypertensives that have, you know, risks of renal function, I've got to put antihypertensive next to the creatinine. This has taken my order entry from being simplistic to being very complex. And the nurses have already told me they ain't doing that complexity. That's the doctor job now. Um, same talk I've gotten from the advanced practice professionals. The acuity adjustment um, will be with HCC and MCC edits. Um, and these edits were basically, well, do the acuity adjustment for comorbidities and within a diagnosis. The problem with those things is that ACC and MCC edits where the adjustment made to the Medicare Advantage plan is Medicare Advantage has always been overfunded um, by Congress with the idea to encourage people to get away from fee-for-service Medicare. So those HCC and, and MCC edits have never been tested with real patient costs and charges to see how truly how they reflect. The Medicare Advantage plans, did, you know, they, when they're overfunded, they didn't really care about our accuracy there. So ICD-10 is not granular enough, despite all the ballyhoo when we went from ICD-9 to ICD-10 for diagnostic diagnoses. Um, but we, you know, for my field, we don't have cancer staging in this. We lack cancer molecular phenotype, type, and most importantly given we have to go through the CDC for this, we can't update it in real time as we make new insight for what's going to adjust for acuity. It's also very <coughs> imprecise. And when you are filling out EPIC or any of the other EHRs, you fill out sort of these uh, clinician-friendly diagnoses. Like for me, one of my patients' things was immunocompromised due to receiving an immunosuppressive drug. Well, that is not an ICD-10 code. That maps to adverse drug reaction steroids. I would never think about it. And if I knew that was mapping to adverse drug reaction steroids, I'm not sure, or adverse drug reaction, I'm not sure I would fill them out. Um, same with diabetes, steroid-induced diabetes maps to adverse drug reaction steroids. Um, so what we are filling out, we have, there's a disconnect from what's on claims. There's a separate software that is independent of the EHR system at any site that gives us these use these clinician friendly diagnoses. So the, the clinician friendly things that you're happening at Stanford versus OHSU versus your practice in an office are completely different. It's what's ever software. There's been no common software here for this. So this is um, um, an issue. The other issue is untreated comorbidities versus partially treated comorbidities have exactly the same ICD-10 code. Um, so one of the issues is we, most of us, lack time for a comprehensive do documentation. <coughs> um, there's also a fear of patient reaction, the error of patient satisfaction scores, of documenting poor compliance for therapy. Um, by statute, we can't put in social, most social determinants of care and what they cost. 
For the oncology care model, one of the things that, that we noted was the big problem with its acuity adjustment and measuring cost was 40% of the people in the oncology care model, which was the at-risk thing for cancer care, were relapsed cancer patients. We don't have a staging system for relapsed cancer patients. How I, as a oncologist, treat somebody who's relapsing seven years out of colon cancer with a solitary met versus somebody who's relapsing um, three months after therapy with multiple metastatic lesions is coded exactly the same. Um, you know, and yet we manage them very, very different. As I said, the poor compliance with therapy are very few codes. We have no code for inability to pay copay. And having practiced lately in Oregon, I have patients who have lived 45 minutes from a gas station. There is no out home care. There is no outpatient PTOT or home-based PTOT. And when I hospitalize them for things like pneumonia, I keep them in longer because I can't get them to care afterwards. So I've got to make sure they're right rock stable to avoid readmissions. Nothing in there will actually deal with that or lack of providers in an insurance plan. Um, CMS has recognized the lack of social determinants, but the only one they have, can do anything with is Medicare and patient being dual eligible, Medicare and Medicaid. You know, for cancer care, family support issues are very important, but these are not recognized in the game. The caregiver, those who need caregivers, we have no way to um, assess and document their compliance and concerns that will show up in the claims data, which is what we all use. We have precious few codes for co uh, deteriorating cognitive skills of patients, um, as well as lack of access, all these things I just talked about. And for a lot of us, transportation cost barriers to keep people from seeking health care. So failure to acuity adjust with macro, and this is what I've been lecturing to Congress, is going to compel cherry picking. Um, and it's going to create barriers to the patients who most need care, those with multiple complex interacting comorbidities, <coughs> the patients with advanced disease and poor so social support compliance, and especially patients with mental health disorders who will also have uh, medical diagnosis. The physician comparison is going to be um, done within specialty. The assumption by Medicare and, and our commercial payers here is that we all treat a bell-shaped curve of patients within our specialty. Um, but a lot of specialties, like mine and hemonc, I just treat acute leukemia and bone marrow transplant. My costs are through the roof compared to somebody who's giving oral chemotherapy for breast cancer. My friends in rheumatology, there are specialists who just deal with the scleroderma and some of those sort of advanced rheumatologic diseases versus those who deal with BJD. Um, and you know, cancer in particular has people focusing on one um, type of problem. Also, in claims data, our advanced practice professionals, the nurse practitioners and, and physician's assistants, are, are, do not have specially assigned to them in claims data. They are just listed as NPs or PAs. So those who are part of my type of a practice are going to be adversely dinged and look very expensive. So CMS set up, had to get, gave a contract to Ackerman to try to set up this, and this is some of the early stuff we did. Um, I was co-chair of two of the committees, first with pulmonary and then cancer. Um, each committee was given eight to ten options for choosing care um, op episodes to measure for cost and quality and outcome. All the episodes were considered high volume, um, and we did have a lot of procedures to choose on. The pulmonary committee was sort of unique. We mostly had acute care episodes, and chronic disease was not initially something we could do. So these were the things that I was given as my options for selecting. I really got rid of this right away, um, and even this, because I said this is due to the underlying disease. Um, this may show up as the most important claim in the claim data for pulmonary, uh, but respiratory failure is whatever caused the respiratory failure is driving the cost and the outcome. Um, and so, and these two, top two, were very hard to measure start and stop sign. So we settled on this bottom one, simple pneumonia. 
Um, and we were trying to choose a, a pop, an episode with minimal patient heterogeneity. But as I told you earlier, this is where I still had my um, um, standard deviation being two to five fold the mean or the median, no matter how long the episode. Um, I, yes, we did try to deal with comorbidities or less impact. Um, here we had to do hospitalization as a trigger. There was not a good trigger for outpatient. And you couldn't just do a chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray was done two or three days before antibiotics started, you know, is antibiotic starting as the, tr starting as the true measure of the episode? The other thing was, for an episode, anything to be decided, it had to be 60% of committee members. Um, and Ackerman was trying to be alt our being getting a diversified group. So we had PT, OT, speech, and nutrition there. They showed up for every meeting. They were 40% of the votes. And I said, this is sort of ridiculous. They're not subject to these me measures. I, as a physician, am. And why are they having 40% of the votes um, for us? Um, my inpatient colleagues were very upset about some of this because they don't really have much control over post-discharge care. They can write the discharge plan and try to do their best, but they lose control the moment the patient's out of the hospital. Um, we didn't know how to adjust cost of care for patient who has allergies to cheaper medications that we got to use an expensive antibiotic. How we dealt with toxicities was also fun. For pneumonia, we felt C. difficile colitis should be included. But for a pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia, which is a very common hospitalized simple pneumonia, there is a maybe 5% incidence of myocardial infarction within two to three weeks after therapy. And that's due to a protein on the pneumococcal bacteria cell surface that causes a delayed vasodilatation. And as you know, delayed dilatation, vasodilatation, if you've got some narrow coronaries, can be a problem there. And it causes infarct. So how do we, you know, deal with that infarct? Um, and the other issue is how do we measure the cost of comorbidities post-discharge as well as those matters inpatient? Um, and so nobody was totally sure with how this is going to work out, and we continue to be very worried about it. Um, we also had lots of discussions about where post-discharge um, rehab care was important, but where patient compliance, patient access to the care was very problematic. Um, and we talked about the rural states having a huge problem here. The other issue is what if local providers were not covered by the patient's insurance or plan, and or you know, they lose insurance during that period of time. Big issue. Um, so we also decided that the, for the pulmonary group, we measure from admission rather than discharge and do a defined period of post-discharge care to try to better, more fairly deal with those patients like um, rural Oregonians who we kept in the hospital longer. Um, so the goal was to have you know, as little variation as possible. Technically, simple pneumonia is supposed to um, exclude a lot of these things. but. Um, reality is when we went through the database with Medicare, about 40% of the simple pneumonias hospitalized were patients with my types of diseases, cancers of the blood making system, which shows you how, again, how bad claims data is. Um, I did take the um, prerogative as chair to exclude patients like those with primary pulmonary hypertension, lung cancer, chest trauma, end stage renal disease. Um, I struggle with these two. Then I struggle with how, you know, an internal medicine provider for some of these is not going to have a huge volume of patients. Someone where we're measuring knee replacements, colonoscopy, has a huge volume of patients. But when you have a small volume of patients, the provider, uh, when the things just happen due to bad luck, it's a problem. And, you know, obviously with my kind of patients over my whole career, I've had to deal with a patient with a lot of bad luck. Um, this pretty much um, says things I've already um, talked about. <coughs> Attribution of care. Um, what physician was going to be measured, and particularly have an inpatient? Um, is it the inpatient doc, the outpatient primary care doc, who the discharge doc? Um, CMS, we thought, and you are this year now, and your claims data have to define your relationship to a patient. 
Are you the primary? Are you just doing acute care? Are you just a proceduralist? Are you just a consult or subspecialist? Well, CMS basically for this pneumonia has decided that the doctor doing 30, any doctor doing 30% of the inpatient ENMs will get credited with that patient's outcome and cost and be measured. You know, this is a huge problem for inpatients. We often have shift work, you know, one or two hospitalists every day. It, um, the admission doctor sometimes sets up the plan. Um, the doctor on the key data finding is really the one who does the plan. And does, the doctor preparing the discharge plan may not be the doctor actually in the day of discharge. Other issue that came up for things like acute myocardial infarction with some of the other groups was is the, doc is the doctor being measured the guy who does the cardiac cath and sticks the stents in, or the cardiologist who's doing the, the daily ENM CCU management? Looks like it's going to be the proceduralist. Um, so for oncology um, episode selection, uh, because claims data did not ca capture cancer staging, um, I again sort of used um, uh, chair prerogative and say that we had to focus totally on surgical diagnoses. So this became lumpectomy, mastectomy, melanoma, bowel resection, or pancreatic resection. This was felt to be pretty rare but high cost. The problem with bowel resection, somebody comes in with an acute abdomen and, and an obstruction, the initial hospital claim usually doesn't deal with have the cancer as the main diagnosis. So that got bowel resection. That's how we ended up with mastectomy and um, and lumpectomy. But there still was a lot of variation there. Um, you know, so I've talked a little bit about the oncology care episode measures, and they have problems with um, triggers. Their, um, the oncology episode was, for us, was focused on the surgical. CMS wants oncology episodes to include chemotherapy, radiation, rehab, pain management, palliative care to promote coordinated care. But we can't do this without cancer staging being in claims. We can't do this well without social factors. And we don't really know how always to do the weight and impact of comorbidities. So going beyond this simple surgery is going to be hugely problematic. I've been able to block this from going forward, but it's a temporary block. Um, so, you know, I, as a, a bone marrow transplant, I've lived in, in case rate payments since 1991. I've written several of the articles on that. Um, with stem cell transplant, we have some of our, for pediatric ALL, which is the most simple of a donor stem cell transplant I do, because um, they usually don't have comorbidities, we have still noticed the top 25th, or top quartile, or 25th percentile, has tenfold to a hundredfold more resources or cost than the median or mean. Um, for our commercial contracts, um, we actually get outlier clauses to deal with them. Now, the rare patient where for commercial contracts where the cases actually have charges less than the case rate, we never get full payment. The commercial payers have refused to give us the full payment for the case rate. So we take it on the chin there where we're supposed to make our profit. Um, the other issue is what do we do with new medical procedures? Um, you know, my guess is as this comes alive again for joint replacement, that my orthopedics colleagues, colleagues are probably a, maybe it might be a good thing ordering extensive medical workup of comorbidities prior to surgery. During CAC period, um, specialists may have to do primary care or carve out those services. For bone marrow transplant, we've never been able to. Um, carve out the cost of pre-BMC chronic disease. It was just too difficult. We always dealt with that as an outlier. OCM, the oncology care model, has really struggled with some of this stuff, particularly in patients now in a care system. They want to get their joint replacement in the middle of their cancer chemotherapy. And how do you deal with that patient who's not done that for a long time? Um, for me, I also have to deal with the problems that my patients have a lot post-transplant the survivors have lots of accelerated metabolism and their outcomes with common diseases are a lot worse and they need, need different screening criteria. They are likely to have problems finding providers. 
CMS believes bundled payments will reward efficiency and value. They believe that we will all see the same broad spectrum of cases and have the lowest cases to make a profit. My experience has been to the contrary there. Um, and they, CMS believes because we all see the spectrum of care, we won't need the document acuity. But I don't know that providers, whether we're taking risk with APMs or with this stuff, will like, cope well with outlier risk, particularly with, you know, my state, 70% of the physicians are employed. Our employers are not going to like the most expensive docs. ACC and MCC Edis have never been tested or looked at for this. And they only adjust for two diseases, not my common five to eight diseases that I'm also simultaneously treated. Physicians who choose with all this to take financial risk better understand the population for resource consumption and make sure they're probably, or everybody's seeing these granular diagnostic codings so they can either get out of the contract or make sure they know where the costs are. Um, they need to understand the severity and the amount of outlier risk. Um, and um, they will have to all need to better understand the drivers of cost, disease complexity, comorbidities, non-compliance, social factors, and novel therapeutics. Um, CM doing a lot of this stuff, CMS will demand that the clinical needs, even when we're taking risk, be documented in claims. The other issue is, you know, we've all talked for decades about medical malpractice and our tort liability, but once we go at risk, our liability switches from torts to fiduciary responsibility. There are no tort caps on fiduciary responsibility because this basically is what, how you nail an insurance company for not following through on covered benefits. Other issues for when you take financial risk, what if there is a loss? If a small community practice in a rural area goes bankrupt, will there be any providers left? Will independent practices survive at all? Or will, not, will there always have to be a hospital system with deep pockets? Will the employers of a physician, tolerate a physician who, whose patients cause a big financial loss? And will expensive service lines be curtailed on accepting patients? I've had to deal with this a lot as bone marrow transplant physician. Um, so I think the pressure, again, for us to cherry pick patients is real. There's also a great, uh, an assumption by CMS Congress that quality care is always cheaper. So far with Obamacare, our preliminary data with ACOs and OCMs have shown that quality coordinated care is not cheaper. Anything is more expensive. Um, patient satisfaction surveys. We've all been sort of dealing with this. While this preceded macro, Congress placed it as a statutory requirement into macro. The Hill staffers that I get to dialogue frequently thought that this would be as useless as airline satisfaction scores and nobody will care. In my town of Portland, Oregon, the Kaiser physicians in the top 20, or bottom 20% for satisfaction are getting fired. They're getting a pink slip. They really have trouble then getting jobs. For oncologists on the initial visit, the oncologist who tells patients the proper, the real survival, the toxicities of therapy impact their life, they don't get the good satisfaction scores. It's the patient who's scared to death of dying of cancer. Um, has somebody sugarcoat the truth? and tell them that they're going to survive very easily. They get great satisfaction scores because the patient has all this sense of false sense of relief. Tougher issues are, are how we're going to deal with some of the more problematic patients. When my patients as a hematologist, oncologist, move from cancer treatment to cancer survival, I still have, a lot of times have to give them opioids. Um, but my um, my opioids is moving more for chronic disease pain. And yes, I, I, because of my patients with low platelet elevated renal function, I don't have the alternatives I can do. Um, but when I practice tough love for an opioid abuser, where I'm just giving, saying you're going to get an X amount of opioids for X amount of time, my patients are upset with me. Um, and they don't give the best satisfaction scores. When I've had that dialogue with CMS, with multiple with pain management, very other specialists, 
we all voiced the same problem. And the retort I got back from CMS was, well, we're not measuring satisfaction scores their, your pain management patient, just their satisfaction with the total visit. And we all say, what planet are you living on um, with that? We have the same issue with declining cognitive care and driving for a lot of my patients or elderly patients. We also have, I was with a young primary care physician from Roseburg, Oregon, who, because they had a gun massacre in Roseburg, um, she questions and queries all her patients about unsecured guns. Them. There's a big gun culture in Roseburg, in Southern Oregon. Um, and patients with, or people with mental health problems having access to those guns. She documents in, this, in her note that she, how she addresses and what the concerns are. Her patients with open notes are immediately reading this and dinging her on satisfaction scores. She's likely to have been fired already. She was in tears because she's trying to do her best to prevent the next gun massacre and the system is thwarting her and it may cost her her career. So just for new technology, what do you do with this stuff when you have no historical claims data? We've got to deal with the CAR T. But we also, interestingly enough, had to deal with this with an old drug, cancer drug called Revlimid, which has been around for 20 years. But when the oncology care model came out, um, a major clinical trial was published showing that it, it made a difference for up to front therapy and for maintenance therapy. So suddenly the uses of red levelment went off the roof. But CMS could not call it new drugs or anything else because it was already just about off patents, a 20-year-old drug. Um, as you, we all know, pharma has never wanted to take pay, um, payment issues into account for pricing and development. There is a disconnect between the FDA and CMS. FDA licensed CAR T as a biologic, which is the same pathway like rituximab and for umbilical cord blood. Um, FDA considers CAR T cellular therapy, but they don't have a licensing authority for cellular therapy, just biologics or, or traditional drugs. Um, we have, um, now we have um, new NCDs for evidence development, coverage development for myeloid dysplasia, sickle cell, and a couple of other new transplants diagnoses. We have no funding for this data requirement. Um, for a CAR T, um, these patients often get readmitted with CAR T with toxicity, but they get readmitted for fever of unknown origin, sepsis, or failure to thrive. They're not. These DRGs are not valued for the rare immunocompromised patients. No one's sure since CAR T patients require lifelong immunoglobulin therapy, um, given the cost of that for every a month of high dose IVG, uh, assuming we have product available, and, pay, and physicians are going to want to take these patients now because they're all and they're coming back in the door high cost for which they're going to have be adversely reported. So again, you know, we have this trouble in medical oncology looking at our doctors. We also have the tr trouble with our survivors. CMS has cut its coverage benefits folks from 25 to less than four now. And what they told the Medicare administrative contractors is to create local coverage decisions by having them in common around the country. Um, and so, we don't have all the necessary checks for local coverage decisions. We, I review them in something called the Carrier Advisory Committee. Occasionally, they can be blocked, but all I can do 